All right, well, uh, this morning I would like to use as our text really all the passages that I've read except for the, the, the psalm for our call to worship. But let me add one more. Let me add John chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 8, uh, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. I just want to read a portion of it. Um, sometimes we forget that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he's actually the one who tells us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is the one who said that, but he also said the words earlier uh, than that, and he tells us how we can believe, how we being dead in our sins uh, and really in a condition not seeking God, uh, not, not doing anything pleasing to God, how can we please him by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we can't do it except by his grace, without his drawing, without his mercy making us alive. And here Jesus tells us that he does it through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about. So let's go ahead and read that in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. John writes, Now there was a, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let me just mention a couple of things at this point. Nicodemus, first of all, recognized that Jesus really was a teacher from God. Now, here's somebody who's a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee, who, you know, a teacher of Israel, who would have been more inclined not to believe in Jesus, but he couldn't resist the fact that Jesus was doing these miracles. Those were the divine credentials that the Father gave his son to prove that he was who he said he was. So Nicodemus is saying, we know that you have come from God. And then notice, secondly, that Jesus didn't comment on that, but he went right to the heart of the matter, what Nicodemus needed to hear. And that's why he just suddenly breaks in with a statement. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, I'm going to come back and I'm going to explain this water and spirit thing, but let me just mention one other thing here. When Jesus talks about the wind, he's, he's using what's called double entendre. It's basically using one image to refer to something else. The word in the Greek for spirit and wind is the same word. So you could actually read this. The Spirit blows where He wishes, and you hear the sound of it, well, you don't hear the sound of the Spirit, but you see the effects of the Holy Spirit, uh, and do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That tells us at least this, that Jesus here is talking about a work that the Spirit does. And he, he blows, breathes life where he wishes, notice, okay? So the idea, again, of selectivity, of, of discrimination in a certain sense. And we see how this all ties together with what we've seen before. So what we want to focus on, again, is the work of the Holy Spirit. So up to this point, we have seen, and again, this is two weeks ago, the Father chose us. Paul tells us as much in, in the passage in, uh, was it um, Ephesians chapter 1? He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. He chose us not because He looked forward and saw that we would trust in His Son, and that by trusting in His Son, we would become holy and acceptable in Jesus. He actually chose us that we would be holy. But He, he chose us, again, knowing that there would be nothing good in us, that we would be those who hated Him and would be His enemies. 
because that's what the Bible says we all are as we come into the world. So God looks forward. Does he see people choosing him? No, he sees people hating him. And he sees people running away from him. And he knows that he must do something in order to change that situation. So the Bible tells us he did. He chose us in eternity. And the reason was purely out of his love that we might believe in the Lord Jesus, whom he would send into the world, and become holy in him. And he made this choice like he did with Jacob and Esau before they were born or had done anything good or bad before he created us, before we were born, in order that his choice might stand. He's the one who chose us. As he said, the, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. We saw that having loved us, he also in eternity determined to save us. He, he purposed to give the price that must be paid in order to save us. And the only price that could have done that was his only begotten son. Now we saw last week that the son also loved us from all eternity and came into this world to pay our debt by becoming one of us, taking on our nature, to live a life of perfect obedience to God, perfect devotion and love, both to provide a perfect righteousness for us and an example of how we are to live and to suffer God's wrath on the cross for our sins. Now, as we saw, both the Father and the Son are intimately involved in our relationship or in our redemption, in our salvation that He has brought about. They have both loved us. They both agreed together to save us. They were both willing to do what was necessary. But now the question comes, what about the Spirit? How was the Spirit involved? How is the Spirit involved in our salvation? Well, actually, He's involved at a number of levels. Okay, let me just mention a couple, then I want to zero in on one. We do know the Spirit of God is the one through whom God made everything. Okay? God is the one who spoke. The Father spoke. The Son is the Word that He spoke. The Spirit of God was hovering over the darkness, and as he received the word, he worked to fashion and to bring order and light out of the chaos and the darkness. So he's the one through whom God created all things. Of course, he is God who created. He's the one who anointed Jesus for his ministry. He was anointed with the Spirit above measure. He's the one who was Jesus' constant companion and comforter and teacher, and the one who empowered him to do the miracles that he did, the one who brought the Word of God down to him, as it were, and revealed it to him so that he might teach it. Again, we could go into the relationship between the two natures of Christ, but we need to remember he was fully man with our limitations, and he needed the Spirit of God to reveal things to him so that he might teach. The Spirit of God is the one who is restraining the sin that is in the world, that's the reason why everyone in the world isn't walking around acting like a Charles Manson or like a Hitler is because the Spirit restrains and He does that until all of our Lord's sheep have been gathered into His fold until this work is finished. But He is also one who loved us in eternity and entered into this covenant, what we call the covenant of grace with the Father and the Son to save us from our sins. Now, here's an interesting point that Jonathan Edwards makes, so I'll give him the credit for it. So if you don't like it, you can also credit that to him. There's a certain sense in which everything that can be attributed to God's love can be attributed to the Holy Spirit. Jonathan Edwards pointed out that he is the love between the Father and the Son, the one that they share from all eternity, the love that they breathe out towards one another. You know, the idea of uh, the Son being the Son, the eternally begotten Son of God. He's, he's, he's eternally begotten of the Father. And He is the Father's exact image. But as the Father, you know, sees His image and as the, as the Son of God beholds the Father, they share this love. And Edward, Edwards considered that to be the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. If that doesn't make sense, we can talk about it later. But this would be then the love that they share. And the love that moved the Father to give His Son for us and that moved the Son to lay down His life for us. He's also the one whom they send into the world to work this love in our hearts. Now, there's no doubt about that. 
so that we might believe and enter into a personal relationship with the Father and the Son. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the love of God. Listen to what Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer in John 17, verses 25 through 26. He says, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known, and notice, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Jonathan Edwards pointed out the love with which the Father loves the Son is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that Jesus gives to us so that we might also love and that, we, that He might be in us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us and that is the same as Christ dwelling in us. Now, it's really that work of the Holy Spirit that I want to focus on this morning. His part in the work of redemption. So let's look at three things. First of all, that the Holy Spirit is the one who united us to the life that is in Jesus Christ. Secondly, that he united us to the righteousness that is in Jesus Christ. And thirdly, that he is working in us to recreate us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So first of all, the Spirit united us to the life that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this is His work in the work of redemption, His part of the covenant of grace. He applies what Jesus did to us. Now, we've already read in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were dead in our trespasses and sins as we came into the world. We needed life, right? Now, now, we weren't physically dead when we came into the world. We were actually born, you know, new creatures in a, in a certain sense. We were physically alive. Life had just started. Our whole future was ahead of us. But the Bible says we were spiritually dead because of Adam's sin. Dead to righteousness. Dead to the things of the Lord. Unable to do anything that would be pleasing to Him. And that's why we live the kind of life, Paul says, that we lived. Um, we couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't receive the life that he would offer to us in Jesus that we would eventually have to face God's judgment. Paul wrote again in Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3, You, that is all of us here, formerly walked in uh, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Again, let me note that Paul was not talking about a specific group of people here that were separate from the rest of the world. He was talking about himself, and he was talking about all the Ephesians, and he's talking about all of us here. This is the way we were when we came into the world. But as we already saw... God did something about it. God got involved. He, he had planned to do so from eternity, and here in time we see it enacted. He intervenes for our good. When we were dead, he raised us to life, verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Remember, grace is a free gift. You didn't do anything to earn it. I didn't do anything to earn it. God did it freely. He chose to do it out of his love. He made us alive. Now, he did this through the Holy Spirit. Jesus, um, going back to our meditation, Jesus said to the Jews... Those Jews that he had fed in John chapter 6, remember the 5,000 he fed from a few loaves and, and a couple of fish. He said to them when they continued to follow him because they really liked the free meals that Jesus had to offer, Jesus said this, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The Spirit of God, and when it says here, God in his mercy made us alive, it's the Spirit who gives this life. And he does it by uniting us to Jesus Christ. There's many ways the Bible talks about being in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is one, okay? 
we are united to him with regard to his life. The, Spirit, the Holy Spirit becomes a, almost, as it were, a conduit that communicates to us spiritual life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of yourself as sort of a, an appliance that's sitting on, on a counter that's not plugged into the wall. There's nothing you can do. You're basically dead because you don't have any electricity. But the Spirit of God comes and he plugs us into Jesus and the electricity or the life of Christ flows through our souls and we become alive. Now Jesus says in this passage, the flesh profits nothing in our own flesh. The way we come into the world in our own strength, we could never do anything to please God. We could never do anything to draw near to God. We could not receive the life of God we were as able to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as a corpse is able to get up out of his, out of his casket in, in the graveyard and receive anything that you might have to offer to him, completely unable. But we, what we could not do because we were dead, the Spirit gave us the ability to do by making us alive in Christ, by uniting us to Jesus Christ. We call this work Regeneration. I'm sure you've heard that word before, regeneration. You know, that word essentially means to be born again, to be born a second time, okay, to be regenerated. And that's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about in our passage in John chapter 3, verse 3. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, unless one is regenerated by the Holy Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus here is, is, is not telling us that this is something we must do, and he's not telling us it's something that, you know, commanding us to do it or that we can do it, but he's telling us it's something that must be done to us. You must be born again. That's passive, right? It's something that must be done to you. You must be born. Okay, well, we were born, right? But we didn't have any choice in that. It was something that happened to us. In the same way, like our first birth, the second birth has to be done to us. So unless, he says, the Spirit causes that to happen, unless he causes us to be born again, we can't see the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom, of, I mean, where is the kingdom of God? Where, where would you go to look at it, okay? It exists, right? And you see it because... Well, because you're born again Christians, right? But how could somebody who is not born again see the kingdom of heaven if that kingdom is invisible? Well, the only way you can see it, of course, is by faith. And faith only comes through the new birth. Now, Jesus went on to say in verse 5 this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Or you can't. You, you know, you can't, you have to be born again to see the kingdom, but you have to be born of the water and the spirit to enter into the kingdom. So what does that mean? Well, there's different ideas as to what the water may mean here. Uh, I used to believe this. I used to believe it refers to the natural birth, you know, because there's water involved in that. And certainly that's true and it's possible. You know, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's the natural birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's the second birth. Others, such as the, the Roman Catholic Church, believe that it's the water of baptism. You have to be baptized, and you have to have the Holy Spirit. Uh, but that can't be true because, obviously, there are people in the Bible who were saved without being baptized. Can you think of one? The thief on the cross, right? But Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, Paul, when he talked about his call to go out and preach the gospel, he said specifically that he did not, he was not sent to baptize, but he was sent to preach the gospel. But if somebody has to be baptized to be saved and to enter into the kingdom of heaven, that wouldn't make any sense. Paul would have to baptize, otherwise his preaching would be in vain. No, he's not talking here about baptism. What he's talking here is about the word of God. He's talking about the gospel. You know, water is often used in the Bible to refer to the Word of God. And I believe that's what he's saying here. And that's why Paul says, the Lord sent me to preach the gospel, okay, which is to basically use the water of the Word, okay? That's what the Spirit uses to make powerful to save. Remember what Paul says in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, 
for it is the power of God to salvation. It is the water of the word which the Spirit of God uses to cleanse by making it powerful through his working. So what Jesus is saying here is unless we hear the word, unless we hear the gospel, and are regenerated by the Spirit, born again, we cannot see the kingdom, we cannot enter the kingdom. It's really the same thing he was saying in our meditation in John 6, 44. No one can, has the ability to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. In other words, Jesus will raise him to life. Now, this drawing that Jesus is talking about here of the Father is interesting because he's not talking about an enticement unless the Father entices you to come, unless he convinces you to come, unless he sort of woos you and, you know, coaxes you to come. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me compels him to come. Actually, drags him. That's what the word means in the Greek. It's, it's a compulsion. It is a dragging. It's like the compelling that you would, uh, let's say, do to water at the bottom of a well. You would send the bucket down with the rope and you would drag that water out of the well. It's like drawing a sword from its sheath, and this word is used in that context. Unless the Father compels us by his Holy Spirit, we do not have the ability to come to Jesus because we are steeled in our rebellion against him. We are dead in our sins. We do not want to come. Now, the, another important thing to see here is this that the Father does not drag us against our wills. He doesn't force us into the kingdom of heaven. But what he does is he creates a compulsion within us by changing the disposition of our hearts by his Holy Spirit. He subdues our hatred by filling us with love. Remember the love the Father and the Son share from all eternity that he puts within us? He causes us to love him so that we will want to turn from our sins, our hatred against him, so that we will want to come to him. The Spirit works through the gospel to bring about the new birth, to give us this love and this desire to come to him. Now, by the way, that's why we needed to hear the gospel, because that is how the Spirit of God regenerates. That's what he uses. Remember, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. We need to hear the gospel for the Spirit of God to work in this way. And by the way, that's also why we need to share the gospel with other people because that is how the Spirit of God will work when we share the gospel. Paul writes in that very famous passage that's used for missions in Romans 10, verses 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear? Without a preacher, how will they preach unless they are sent? You see, why would Paul even write that if they didn't need to hear the gospel? The gospel is important. We call that gospel the outward call, but we call the work of regeneration by the Holy Spirit the inward call, which makes the outward call powerful to save. And that is the first part of the Spirit's work. He unites us to the life of Christ. If you're trusting in Jesus, he has united you to the life of Jesus. That's why you're alive and not dead. That's why you're able to trust. But secondly, the Spirit also united us to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Spirit worked through the gospel to bring us into union, a living union with Jesus that makes us alive. But once we believed, once we trusted in Jesus, we came into another union with Jesus and that we call a legal union with him. And this is really the part, I think, that we, that we like the best because uh, basically we, we shared with Jesus everything we had at that point. But what did we have to share with him? All we had was sin. All of our sin became his, okay? It was credited to him. It was imputed to him. Now, we know that our sins were laid on Jesus on the cross. We know that he paid for those sins there. As we saw last week, Jesus says, I laid down my life for the sheep, but it isn't until we believe that they are removed from us and we are actually forgiven. So everything in this legal union that we have becomes his, but he's already paid for it and he carries it away. 
Now, perhaps more importantly, or at least equally as importantly, all that he has becomes ours in this legal union. By the way, this is another analogy used in Scripture to refer to this as a marriage, right? When you, be, when you get married, you basically share what you have with, with the one you're, you're marrying, with your spouse. Everything that he has, ladies, becomes legally yours. Everything you have becomes legally his. And that's what's happening here. When we're united with Jesus legally, everything that he has becomes ours, his righteousness, which Luther called an alien righteousness, one that's outside of ourselves. It's imputed to us and credited to us. And because our sins are taken away and his righteousness now covers us because we're in him, God declares us to be just. That's justification. Now, all of these things, the outward call of the gospel, the Spirit's inward call, that, that new birth, the union with Jesus, the faith and the repentance and the justification, these all happen at the same time, at the same moment in time. These are not you know, separated by you know, a minute or an hour or a day or a week. You, you're not alive and then like 20 years later you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All these things happen at the same moment, but there is a logical order in which they must take place, right? You have to hear the gospel before the Spirit is going to call you. But you have to be called by the Spirit, united with Jesus, before you can be spiritually alive. You have to be spiritually alive before you can believe. You have to believe before you can be forgiven and clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And of course, you have to be forgiven and clothed in the righteousness of Christ before God can declare you to be just. There's a logical order, but they happen at one moment, okay? When the Spirit makes you alive, all these things happen in a moment of time. By the way, some other things happen that are also um, great blessings. Once we're legally united to Jesus and declared to be just, there are two more things. God adopts us into his family. We become his children. We have the right to call him our father because he really is our father. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 15 through 16, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So we are adopted into the family and we become legal heirs and fellow heirs with our Lord Jesus Christ of his kingdom. Paul continues in verse 17. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Through this legal union, we have become the heirs of the kingdom, which means that we will have our part in the new heavens and the new earth because of what Jesus has done. So the Spirit of God unites us to the life of Jesus, makes us alive so we can trust Him. When we trust Him, we have a legal union with Jesus and all of our sins are, are given to Him and all of His righteousness is given to us and we become His heirs. But fine, And again, this is the work of the Holy Spirit creating this union between us. But finally, the Spirit is recreating us into the likeness of Jesus. Now, this is how we know that we have received the blessing of living union and legal union with Jesus, and that is that we see his life active in our lives. Now, sometimes the Lord saves people. Sometimes he just takes them out of the world as soon as they're saved, and, and you don't get to see that process take place. Although there may be some indications, even the thief on the cross, remember? Uh, he was beginning at the crucifixion. He was hating Jesus and... As, as is written in Scripture, hurling abuse at him as well. But somewhere along the line, something changed. And he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, something happened. The Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, plugged him into the life of Jesus, created that legal union between him. He trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and he was saved. And his life was immediately transformed. He stopped hating Jesus Stopped abusing him and he started trusting him. And he says, Lord, remember me. That was an act of faith. So even, even in those last moments, there's going to be some kind of change. But 
more often than not, people aren't saved just as they're dying, but they're saved while there's still some life ahead. And so, more often than not, the Lord leaves us here after He has saved us. And He does that for two reasons. First of all, He wants to prepare us for heaven, okay? Jonathan Edwards talked about there being a fitness. He, he sort of fits us or prepares us by breaking off our love of sin and giving us a greater love for heaven. But he also wants to use us, right? He wants to use us to reach others with the gospel. Now, one of the Reformation mottos was this. We are justified by grace through faith alone. Okay, I think we're all familiar with that. But not by a faith that is alone. Faith is always accompanied by good works. There will be transformation. That's another way of saying sanctification will always follow justification. James says this in James 2.26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. If you have saving faith, if the Spirit of God has given you the life of Christ, if you're trusting Jesus, okay, you will have good works in your life. Your life will change. As new creatures in Christ, we are becoming like Him. Remember I told you that He lived a perfect life to give us a perfect righteousness, but He also lived a perfect life to be an example to us? Well, that example is what we are to be following and the example we will be following if we belong to Him, we are doing what He would do. Okay, sadly, we're not going to be perfect in this life. There's still a lot we're not going to do that he did. But we are really going to be being changed into the image of Jesus. This is the blessing of the new covenant where the Lord says, actually in Jeremiah 31, but quotes it in Hebrews chapter 8, I will write my law upon their hearts. Okay, this is the law written on the heart. God gives us a love by the Holy Spirit for what? For what he says in his law, that law that Jesus lived according to perfectly in order to earn us a perfect righteousness, he causes us to love that law so that we will live according to that law. Now, this, this is how the Lord prepares us for glory. This is how he breaks our love of the world and how he basically gives us a love for that world which is coming through the work of the Holy Spirit, transforming us into the image of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus didn't want to go to heaven? No, he wanted to go to heaven, right? He knew he had to drink the cup and go through that suffering and death before he, he would enter into to heaven, but he certainly wanted to go there. The Spirit of God, of course, working in his heart, giving him a love for heaven. That's exactly what the Spirit of God does in our hearts so that when it comes time for us to die, we also will be ready and we will gladly leave this world so that we can go to be with our Lord in that heavenly home. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, creating in us the image of Jesus. But as I said, also he has another purpose, uh, why he's doing this. And that's to equip us to serve him while we're in this world. There are many, remember how Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me, I give eternal life to them. He says there are, there are others who are not of this fold that still need to hear his voice. And we just heard Paul say, how can they believe unless they hear him? But how can they hear him unless somebody goes to preach, right? So the Lord has left us here in order to reach the people who still need to be reached with the gospel. He doesn't just take us to heaven as soon as we're saved because he wants us to share the gospel with those whom he has yet to gather in to the fold so that the Spirit of God can also bring them to Jesus. So what does the Spirit of God do in the work of salvation? Well, what he does is he, he basically takes what Jesus has done and he applies it to us. He plugs us into the life of Jesus, unites us legally with Jesus so we get all of his benefits, and he recreates us into the image of Jesus. And that's a tremendous blessing which you cannot buy, but something the Lord freely gives. And the whole purpose behind this is to see how precious the gospel actually is. If we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a blessing, a gift beyond measure, right? We've seen really that all three persons of the Godhead are involved in this redemption. If you are redeemed, the Father loves you. The Son loves you. The Spirit loves you. 
which means that He chose you. The Father chose you. The Son came into the world and He lived and died for you. And the Spirit of God applied that work to you. The Father was willing to, to give the price, what was most precious to Him, in order to save you. Jesus came and He paid the price. And the Spirit, here's the interesting part, the Spirit is what Jesus actually came into the world to purchase for us. And then He gives us the Spirit freely, and that's what makes all the changes, the life of Christ, the legal union, the Spirit of God, uniting us with Jesus. That is what Jesus purchased for us. And the Spirit is the one who made us alive, gave us faith, so that we could look to Jesus and receive His righteousness and be justified, and then His grace to transform us into His image. This is really what the Reformers were talking about when they were talking about the five solas of the Reformation. So let's just conclude with that. The Reformers said, God's work of redemption is, remember, sola gratia, which means by grace alone. The Father has provided all through His grace, through His love. He did it all. It's solus Christus, which means by Christ alone. Jesus has done it all through his obedience and death. We don't have to earn anything. Jesus has earned it all. It's sola fide. It's received by faith alone. By the way, that's what R.C. is going to talk about this evening. We receive what Jesus Christ has done. We receive it. Okay, we don't earn it. We don't have to merit it. We don't even have to work up the faith in ourselves to try to get it. God gives us the faith to look to Jesus, and we receive it freely by faith alone, a faith that is created by the Spirit alone. I hope you see God's the one doing all of this. Why sola dea gloria to the glory of God alone? That he might receive all the glory. You know, what, what does Abraham have to boast before the Lord? You know, nothing. No one may, may boast because it's all of the Lord. And then sola scriptura. The reason why we believe this is because that's what the Bible alone says. Rome has, you know, the apostolic fathers, they have the traditions, they have the papal canons and bulls, councils, they have, you know, the Pope speaking ex cathedra, which means from the chair of Peter on the issue of ethics and, and uh, doctrine, and he's supposed to be infallible, and they have the Bible, okay? We have the Bible. That's where God has spoken, the Bible alone. That is what it teaches. That's why we need to believe it. And what it tells us is God did it all. And he offers it to us freely. So why is the Reformation important? Again, it's because the Lord restored the gospel to his church. The only message the Spirit of God works through to bring about the new birth, to create the faith and repentance that can reconcile us to God. So I would encourage you again to come this evening. As R.C. Sproul reminds us again, where it is we really differ with Rome when it comes to the gospel. Let me just say, this difference is a difference of life and death right? You can't be saved in both ways. There's only one, and the Bible clearly points us to the one way, which is faith alone. Not, you know, not faith plus works, but faith alone. So if you're able to come uh, this evening. Well, let's, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's um, ask the Lord to apply this to our lives, but let's also pray that He would prepare us to come to the table, because we're going to be celebrating the Lord's table here in just a couple of moments, and we need to make sure that we are repenting of our sins, that we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are living the life the Lord calls us to live. Let, let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer.